What do I do? I wake up, brush my teeth. Scroll on social media. Drink my morning coffee while I rush to work. Take a second to check my bank account and budget again. I wake up, brush my teeth. Scroll on social media. Busyness. Worry. Busyness. Worry. Jealousy. Busyness. Worry. Jealousy. You might think these sins are a big deal, but to me, they seem completely harmless. Well, good morning, family. Good morning. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we dive in. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, as we sing, we recognize how great you are. Lord, we worship you today and we thank you for your presence being with us. Now, we've come to you to hear what you have to say. Although it might not be comfortable for us to hear, Lord, we ask for you to speak to us. Lord, teach us today. Show us today who you are. Reveal to us the life you've called for us to live. Lord, let it be challenging to our hearts. If that's what we need to become more like you, then challenge us, Lord. So, Father, we thank you. We're here to hear you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are, are new here, we're so glad that you're here with us. Um, we're glad that you've decided to be here in service with us. And if you're new online, uh, same thing for you. We're so glad that you are joining us today as we go into our sermon series, which is called Harmless Sins. This is the, the last message that we're going to be talking about in this series called Harmless Sins. Now, as we begin to talk about harmless sins what we've come to realize is that God has called us to live different than the rest of the world. The world has a way of living, and in a lot of ways, it's taken over a lot of our culture, and it's become cultural norms where we'll find ourselves living in these places of sin. Now, <laughs> we are going to be different. When we look at Jesus, they didn't like him. Why? Because he was strange, he was different, what he said was different, the way that he lived was different. And so the call for us is to walk and live like Jesus. But often, and for many of us, we look no different than the world. Those barriers, those lines have be, been crossed. And we look like the, the very people that God has called us not to look like. So now the challenge for us is to step out of those, those places and to step in to the place of looking and living like Jesus. That means analyzing the way we talk. I know some of our language. It means analyzing how we live. It means analyzing what we watch. This is what it means to be different. And it's not always comfortable. Really, because it's been normal to live the way the rest of the world does. Because the way they, they do it is the way that you're supposed to do it, right? God calls for us something different. We, we talked in the very first part of the, the, the series. We said busyness should not be the way of living. There's a life of work and rest that God has called for us. It's the way that he modeled. It's the way he's called for us to live. So our challenge is now to step in that. And we know that can be uncomfortable for us. Where is the space going to be at? I don't know. But I do know what God has called for us and how he's called us to live. We talked about worry, that we shouldn't live a life of, of worry, that God has not placed that thing on us, and, and God has, has saved us and given us protection and said, I'm going to provide for you, and so we shouldn't have this place of worry in us. And the next thing that we're going to be talking about is envy and jealousy. <laughs> I spent 
quite a bit of time this week really trying my best to analyze envy and jealousy and why it's hidden. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know that I have a great answer. I'm going to give you the best that I possibly can. Because I think when I say envy and jealousy, it's easy, it, 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 at least it was for me to go, well, I don't know that I deal with that. I, I don't know that I'm jealous of anybody or anything. I don't know that I have these type feelings in my heart. But I really think and I really believe that if we will listen and hear what God has to say, he will unravel those things and bring them to the surface. Now, I think for, to a certain extent, they're embarrassing. Who wants to say that? Oh, well, I'm envious or I'm jealous. Nobody really wants to say that. So I think maybe we crush them down and we press it down. I think also, too, this emotion is so common to the world and now has be common, become common to us that we look at it like any other emotion that we might have. Envy and jealousy are some dangerous emotions. Envy and jealousy are byproducts and are products of, of feel, uh, feelings that are out of control. And we talked about um, concern uh, bringing us to this place of worry and it gets out of control. And that when other feelings find themselves out of whack and, and out of control, they draw us into these places of jealousy and envy. It's really this, this place of, of not checking your emotions. We have a habit as people of God of not checking our emotions. We feel that they are ours and that we should have these. And I'm not saying every emotion is bad, but you got to realize a lot of times it begins to create some deep roots. We're going to have emotions. We're going to have feelings, but it's a matter of checking them. Holy Spirit, I need you to check this. I need you to look at how I'm acting or look at how I'm feeling. And I need you to mold this because right now I don't feel like it is actually taking me closer to you. It's actually drawing me further away and drawing me into myself. It's a matter of who is leading. Am, am I leading? Is the enemy leading? Or am I allowing the Holy Spirit to lead my life? And when we don't, we can find ourselves in envy and jealousy. When we look at the world, I would say that a lot of its driving force for the way that the world will live their life, for their pursuits of many things, are driven from places of envy and jealousy. And out of envy and jealousy come lots of heavy emotions and dangers for people and for us as individuals. One, there's places of greed that comes out of envy and jealousy. We look at our world and we see the problems that we have in them. People are hungry and it comes down to greed. Driven by the fact that maybe I want more and I want more and want more. Hatred, hatred comes out of envy and jealousy. We even see sins against others that come from the place of envy and jealousy. And so what I want to do is I want to help us to unearth these places of envy and jealousy that might be in us. And honestly, envy and jealousy in people almost kind of have different fingerprints. And then that's sometimes why it's hard to, like, to pick it out. Because each of us kind of deal with it in a different manner. And, and I uh, hope today as I share this with you that we can pull, pull these out. Now, I want us to understand that envy and jealousy are, are, are really two different words. All right, so I'm going to spend some time talking about envy and jealousy, what it can look like in, in our lives, and then what do we do? How is God calling for us to live? And so the first one I want to talk to you about is envy. Now when I say envy, understand I'm speaking of a want. 
All right. And it's a longing, a desire, a unrighteous want after something. Understand when I'm saying this, like you could go like, you know, I I want a, a new car. That might be fine. But envy turns this, this corner when it becomes a desire, a urge, a longing after something, and particularly it's with someone else. Envy is the longing to have what someone else has, uh, whether it be an attribute or a possession. It could be someone's attribute, but overall, generally, most of the time we find envy when it comes to possessions. So I started praying about God, you help me. I, I'm really wrestling with this place of envy. He reminded me of a, a time I had a uh, uh, students in my youth ministry. This is back in Tennessee. And I had one kid that was in my youth ministry is on my basketball team. And uh, his dad would invite our family over to his house. Uh, and this is a wealthy man. <laughs> He's a very wealthy man. Uh, the gigantic house, home, had a little golf course in the backyard, had a nice little pool, had the big entrance way. Y'all, he had a circle driveway. All right. All right, you get a circle driveway, you know what I mean? Like, so I would get to this house and I would see all these things and I would see this big stairway that you got to walk up and it was, it was a beautiful home. And I get back home and go, well, my place is a dump. Right, I, I see mine and I go, man, that mine is in no comparison to his. But the reality was, mine wasn't a dump. That wasn't the truth. But it began to pull on me and tug on me. Matter of fact, I remember having a conversation with my wife about getting a circle driveway. <laughs> and then she's like, there's no way we can get a circle driveway in our small front yard. And I'm like, can we get a U-shaped? I mean, if I can't get a circle, can I at least have half of it? <laughs> this is where envy began to start digging its nails in. You, you want to know where I honestly think it started at? Y'all remember uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Y'all, that show messed me up. I saw that, I saw all this stuff, and that became the, the threshold for looking like, hey, I made it, I have the things, that's what I want, that's what I need, and if I don't have it, I'm always falling short. My place wasn't a dump, beautiful home. We had a pool in the backyard, it was above ground, but had a pool nonetheless. I really had all the exact things that he had. But I saw mine as a place of nothing. And it came from a place of comparison. I had taken mine and I had taken his and I felt that mine was lacking. There's a man named Sam uh, Newlands and he's an author and he said this. Envy sees the world in terms of comparison and measurement. If you think you are really ugly and hopeless and useless, it's not because you are. Uh, these things, but because you choose to measure yourself against the people who you envy. You have chosen a measurement, and that measurement has begun to rule all your decisions, all of your thinking. Here's what uh, Paul has to say about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Um, and he's speaking to some uh, criticizers of him. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Some people have come to Paul, and Paul has written these letters, and now Paul has been spending a lot of his life um, uh, making sure everybody understands his apostleship, that this has been given to him by God. And so we come down to this part, and and so he writes these letters, and these people hear these letters, and they go, man, your letters are impressive, but when we meet you, you're not impressive. Because they had used a comparison in the fancy ways of their world of talking. I mean, this guy is good, this guy's good, uh, this guy's better than me, I'm not, he's better, I'm better than him. And this is this this way of 
comparing to each other. And Paul's going, as a matter of fact, in your comparison, number one, I'm not going to compare myself to the world. I'm not going to be measured by the way of the world. I don't need that comparison, and nor do I want that comparison. And a matter of fact, it is unwise to look at the world and measure yourself to the world. Let's be honest with you. Based, with it, based on the standards of the world, it's an endless pit. You'll never live up to the world. You'll never live up to the standards. You can't. You can have all the money in the world and still fall short. It's an endless pit of more and more and more. I think the other part to realize is that the road through the cross is flat ground. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how little you have. When we get on the other side of that, it was by the grace of God. We had nothing to give. It was through Jesus Christ. Who cares about comparison? All these things will burn up. The only thing that will last are the righteousness that we have gained from Jesus Christ. The next thing that we see about envy is that envy causes us to lose sight of our blessings and focus on other, what other people have. When you find yourself in a place of envy, go ahead and realize that you're blind to your own blessings. You have looked at someone else's things and completely forgotten what God has blessed you with. We have to be mindful. Um, understand that the world bases itself on making sure that you f- don't feel adequate enough. All right, think about what every commercial is. Every commercial is, you don't have this, so therefore you need to get it because you're lacking. Everything we see on TV is based off of that. Everything that we see on social media is based off of going, look what I got, look what you don't have. And it's easy to get caught in this place. And we become blind to the very blessings that God has given us. Now what is so interesting about envy is that it yields no pleasure as a sin. Now, generally, all other sins that we find ourselves involved in, it is because we receive some pleasure out of them that we find ourselves going back to it over and over and over again, right? We go, it felt good, so I'm going to do it again. But envy doesn't do that. It leaves no pleasure whatsoever. As a matter of fact, envy really only has this place in rotting you from the inside. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 30 says this, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bone. I spent a little bit of time to try to figure out, well, how long would it take for bones to rot? (laughs) Four to 30 years. Buried in the ground, it would take four to 30 years for a bone to rot. When you have envy in you, you're already started rotting. And all of this, from this place, all of this is a byproduct of a heart that does not find God satisfying. Somewhere in our heart, we have not been satisfied with that with what should satisfy us completely and totally. And that is what comes from God. We have no longer found or not found God to be satisfying. Now some places where we find envy in our lives where we can is um, relying on, on constant success or accumulations to be deemed worthy. So just things for you to be thinking about. A tendency to judge, judge yourself against the success of others. Or beliefs that other people have advantages or possessions that you want. Jealousy is the feeling of being fearful of losing your position or status to someone else. So I'm going to go over to uh, jealousy 
as we've ended out with envy. I think I've got a passage as we talk about jealousy um, that, will sh- that will really bring out what jealousy looks, up, looks like. And this is a passage of King David um, who, uh, in Saul, King Saul. King Saul is the first king of Israel. And there's a situation that's come about where jealousy has now come about in, in him. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 18, 5 through 9. And here's what it says. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, speaking of David, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in his army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. So everybody was loving what David was doing. When the men were returning home after, home after David uh, had killed the Philistines, the women came out from all the towns in Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing with joyful songs and with uh, 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 timbrels and lyres as they danced and sang. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but with me only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept his eye on David. Now, I think this is a perfect example of where we see uh, jealousy. We've spent time talking about envy. And how we can find ourselves in this place of envy by this comparison. And now we see in this passage this place of jealousy. King Saul has become angry. And a heart of jealousy has been unearthed really because of David's success. David has become so successful that now King David is now jealous. What does that look like? For us to do the same type thing. I really think that it comes about. And and, and I think it's little hints. Of things that we have to watch out for. Have you ever been with somebody. And uh, they went. You know I don't know. Man. they, Whoever it is. That person over there. Man they they, they are so great. But they do a good job. And inside your heart you're like. "Mm." Instead of celebrating, yeah, you know what, you're right. I see the same thing or I recognize that exact same thing. We're angry. Because somebody else is getting something that really we would want. We can find that in us. These are one of those little hint things that I think sometimes we ignore. We can't ignore it. We can't ignore it. It, When it pops up, you need to go, man, why could I not celebrate with that person who celebrated someone else? Why could I not? What is going on? Holy Spirit, work inside of me. Maybe there's a conversation I need to have with this person, whatever it might be. It can't go unchecked. It should not be unchecked. You know, one of the places that I just thought about where I think um, envy or where jealousy can be prevalent um, is in professional sports. Now, uh, you know, I'm Chiefs won Super Bowl, and I could hear you guys screaming, hollering all the way at my house. Okay, <laughs> I knew just saying that. <laughs> I share that. Uh, I share that with you on this note. They are in constant competition that somebody is going to come about and take their position. I, it's got to be, I mean, I, I want it. Um, that's what I wanted. I want to do professional sports. And I, everybody did. It's kidding. I want to be Michael Jordan. So everybody wanted to be like Mike and I wanted to be the same way. So my life was to go, I want to be a professional player. But I can only imagine being that and fearing the next young guy that just walked in. That's bigger, that's stronger, that's faster, might not have your IQ yet, but it won't be long before you have it and then you're out the door. 
And because of this, you can find these places where it, it breathes anger and tension, even amongst teammates. This is a place of jealousy. This is what happened to Saul. David was on his team. When we, uh, 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 um, he didn't need to be jealous. First off, the women didn't come out and say, we want David who slain his ten thousands as our king. They never said that. Now that's what he heard. David didn't say, since I've slain my ten thousands, I'm coming after your job. David never said that. Matter of fact, if you follow David and the way that he lived, he loved and respected Saul, even though Saul was constantly after him. In moments where he could have killed him, he, he said, I'm not going to lay my hands on the anointed one. David was not necessarily, it was, David was not after his kingdom. He wanted to please his king. But I need you to understand when we find ourselves in these places of jealousy, we have created these things of, of we have co- created jealousy filters. Let me just say that much. And so when we have on this jealousy filter, Anything about the person that we're jealous gets converted into something else. What Saul heard, David has killed his 10,000, Saul has killed his thousands. Oh, David has killed his 10,000, Saul has thousands, so therefore we want another king and that's David. That's not what they said, but when it's put through that jealousy filter, that's exactly what he saw. That's what he heard. And because of this, it says in verse 9, and from that time on, Saul kept his eye on David. And so from him, he sees David as a threat. Jealousy has this way of creating these spaces and these places of distancing from the very people who we are called to love and our very people that we love. Instead of being close, instead of being in relationship, now they've been cast to the side and they've become a threat. And this is what we can find ourselves in in places of jealousy. And here's some things that I thought that maybe just for you to think about. There's a harder jealousy that's in there. Um, when we find ourselves unhappy with others around us um, that have success, maybe there's some jealousy that's there. Or we become upset with people when they compliment others. And so those are some places to be processing when it comes to jealousy. So what do we do? How do we live? How do we live a life that is free of envy and of jealousy? I'm not going to jump ahead of myself. First thing I want you to know, praise God for the gifts he has given. Okay? Okay. James chapter 1 verse 17 says this, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. This is the Apostle Paul who is speaking here and going, Do you realize that every gift that you have is given to us from God? From our very Father in heaven, these gifts have been given to you. It's not by our efforts, okay? It's not by our abilities. It was a gift that came from God. And not only is a gift, what does he call it? Perfect. Usually when something is perfect, guess what it has to be done? Custom. I buy jeans all the time. They're never perfect. But let me go get some made. Perfect. I've never had any made before. I just assumed they would feel good. (laughs) That means God saw you and said, hey, I'm perfectly going to give you this good gift and it is made perfectly for you. Our problem is we go, "I, I want that over there. But we miss the God, thank you. It might be little, but it's big to me. Because you gave it to me. Some of us struggle 
Uh, some of, of the struggle we have with envy and jealousy is because we are not appreciating the giver who gave it. We are not appreciating God and going, thank you for giving this to me. Thank you for my blessing. It's, it's, matter of fact, my efforts and my ability are all because of you too. I know what you've gave, given me is good and I know what you've given me is perfect, Lord. And I see it and I thank you. This is how we begin to live this life free of envy and jealousy. But there's one more that I think is just as important, maybe even more important. And is that we have to learn to be content. Now, Philippians chapter 4 verse 11 through 13 says this. I am not saying that because I am in need. Um, this is Paul that's writing a letter. Um, and he says, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know that what it is to be in need. So he knows what it needs to, to need things. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul, understand, Paul is in not the greatest situation. He's at the end of getting, coming close to the end of his life. He's older. He's in prison. He might be older, but he has gained some major wisdom. He says, I have learned to be content. In other words, it is not natural for us to be content. There is a place and a process where we have to grow in this place of contentment. What is natural for us? Greed, lust, anger. Like these are the things that are natural to us. That's what the world does. But we are no longer natural beings. We are People who are made by Christ Jesus and in his light and brought to life through Christ Jesus. So now we should live in a different manner. But it's a process that we have to grow in. But learning to be content is an ever-growing process of finding out that God is enough. Now God says he is enough. He spells out in scripture, I'm just going to show three, share three of them. Where he says that he is these things for us, that we don't need them. Uh, John chapter 6 that says that he's the bread of life. Promising to feed us spiritually. Uh, uh, Psalm 46 says that he is a shelter and strength. He goes on providing you protection. Philippians chapter 4 says he is a provider. Meaning that he will provide for all that we need. Where we have to stop doing and grow in is not trying to fill our things with things that are ultimately going to end up filling us, making us feel empty. You gain more, you're only going to want more. You gain more, you get a bigger house, you're only going to want a bigger house. You want this thing, that's all that's going to end up happening. It is a truly an endless pit. You're only left with wanting more and you're never truly satisfied. So then the process that we need to grow in is growing in a process of being hungry for Jesus. The question is, are you hungry for Jesus? Are you hungry for the one that is true and all satisfying? So you know what happens when we hunger after Jesus? There is nothing that would come in comparison. Not money, not stuff, not people, nothing. We will, then we will come to this place of where Paul was at, was like, look, when I had, had little, I was content. When I had plenty, I was content. When I was free, I was content. When I was a slave and in prison, I was content. Because Jesus was my sufficient one. We need 
to hunger and thirst after Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, when you hunger and thirst after him, there's nothing else that will do. But then the next step is really up to you all. I can't do it for you. I've got a journey I've got to walk through. You have a journey that you have to walk through. And it's about taking these next steps to go, you know what, God? I don't want anything else to be enough for me anymore. Besides you. So Lord, help me to be satisfied by you. And help me when I find these places of envy and jealousy to run to you. Because I have begun to hunger after something else other than you. It'll be a process. And all of us in here might be very old when we get there. But it is a journey. But it's a journey that is honorable to keep walking and taking steps to being more like Jesus. Because when we're content, we have peace. You want to know why? Because we're off that rat race. I don't have to prove anything. All I had to do was accept Jesus Christ. So I actually have all that I need. It's accepting a place of peace. It's accepting a place of rest. That only comes from being satisfied by Jesus Christ. For us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, let's grow in this process of being satisfied by God. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, I want you to be satisfied by God. And it's simple. He promises to be a provider. He promises to be your fortress. He promised to feed you spiritually. And some of us in here have not been fed spiritually at all. And we can be fed by the satisfiers, Jesus Christ, by accepting him as Lord and Savior. And if you will do that, you are now are going to be people of God. And so if you accept him as Lord and Savior and say, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, he has come to satisfy you. And now it's a process of growing in that. Family, I have a next set for you. And it's just some thoughts for for you to process. Just say, where am I discontent? Where in my life do I see that I'm discontent or I need more or I feel that I'm lacking? And how has God provided for that? It's just some things for you to be processing this week. Let's pray together.